So I'd like to welcome everybody that's attending tonight. Uh, I'm sorry we can't see you all, uh, but uh, we, we know we have a pretty good crowd here and we have a very good speaker and uh, a great topic and one of our favorite, favorite birds here in Florida. So I was just gonna get started with a little bit of uh, a discussion. What happened there? Is that the next slide? Are you seeing? I think this is probably there's my, a lot of videos. Uh, we we're, uh, we're going to be recording this uh, speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Alan Pohl, and uh, we have a lot of other nice videos on our, uh, our on our website, and. We recently increased this to include many of the excellent videos from Audubon, Florida, which is the state organization. They have some really wonderful videos too that they're letting us have because we've gotten a lot of good contact with them. And we're working actually with a new TV stations, TV 30, and who is playing some of these videos for the, for the community. And we've contacted National Audubon and they're going to be sending us some of the videos too. So you need to get on our website and see videos. You can watch them on the TV program if you have a, on the weekend. an antenna, but because it's a new program just starting, but they're going to be on, uh, on cable uh, this fall. So, uh, and they're doing a lot of promotion for Audubon. We really appreciate that. Uh, one of the nice videos that we have is a birder's guide to migration and some of the two youngest uh, birders are doing a terrific job in our community showing folks where are the best places to um, observe the birds in Indian River, Bivard and St. Lucie <clears throat> counties close by. Of course, we have a presentation of uh, Doug Talamy and uh, that is uh, one of his presentations on our website too. These are some others that we got on different birds and things. Uh, kind of related to our speaker tonight, we have a six minute video that Nita and I put together talking about the ospreys and, and out at Blue Cypress Lake, uh, we think is probably the largest, one of the largest populations in, in the world. It's uh, over 300. It is. Close to 350. We've been monitoring them for the last four years and we're hoping to, to go out in the next few weeks to uh, do this year's uh, area. This is the photo of the month. This is by Andy Liu who came down from Boston area, uh, Newton area, and took this, we went to the Green K wetlands, and this is a lovely shot of a very secret bird, the, the Wilson snipe. And it certainly shows its pattern and its long, long beak that I, in the telegram, talk about how unique this bird is. And so everybody, all you photographers, submit your photos of the month to the photo of the month and all about plants. We have started morning nature walks. And a week ago, we went to downtown and saw the nesting terns on the roofs. And the more, this is the next morning walk, nature walk. And we like local places, an hour and a half at the most. And Egret Marsh is our next one. It's all filled up. But just to let you know that we're happening and watch out for the next one. And if anyone wants to lead a walk and let us know, and we'll sign up for a morning walk. So many lovely little places take a short time to view. But if you have a favorite, I'd like to know about it, share it. And Holly, before the turn walk, showed us how to do eBirds. So this is another video online. And it's so you can get online and learn so much about the birds with eBird. And of course, that's another Cornell product that we is free and uh, we all should be using it. And we had a great uh, global big day. Uh, we really had the second highest uh, number of species in our county. And I thought it was great. We had a big turnout of many people, more people this year than ever before. So thanks for all joining in. 
that gets us down to our talk tonight, which is about Osprey, uh, the revival of a global raptor. And uh, Dr. Alan Pohl is associate at the Cornell Lab of Ornithologist, the former editor of a great the Birds of North America Life History Series, fantastic uh, page of all the birds and all the information that you need to know about birds. It's really fantastic. He has studied osprey for over 35 years and has written a couple of books on ospreys. The first book, uh, Bob Montanaro, our office manager, told me was the, his inspiration. Bob went out and uh, spent two years uh, almost on a daily basis, observing what went on with one osprey nest. And uh, especially the, for the three months when a lot of activity was going on, he found a lot of other birds around that site, but that inspired him to uh, put together a program that's been very popular too for us. So I think Bob's on our, our uh, call tonight, but uh, we really appreciate you coming or presenting here, you're not coming, but <laughs> you're up in Massachusetts. And uh, uh, Dr. Alan Poole, we look forward to your talk tonight. Jeremy. Thank all of all of you who have joined uh, here today. Um, I'm delighted that we have so many. I'm delighted to be back in Florida, so to speak. i am um, got my start with uh, Ospreys as a um, as a grad student doing some work in Florida Bay. I'll talk about that in, in a little bit, but uh, I still have a very <clears throat> great fondness for South Florida and, uh, and for the ospreys that are there. But what I'd like to do today is uh, this evening is to take you a little bit on a, on, a, on a world tour of ospreys because although they're doing so well in Florida, and you have so many there, and the same is true here in, uh, in New England. Um, we really have a global species here. It's not found <clears throat> just up and down our coast. It's found pretty much around the globe. There's no continent that doesn't see ospreys, at least at some point during the year, except for Antarctica. So this is a bird that's really made its way around the planet. And, um, Although it's the same bird everywhere, pretty much, uh, it is uh, very different experiences in different parts of the world. And that's part of what I wanna bring alive for you today is um, the, the different habitats that are supporting ospreys, how, how, what an adaptable bird uh, this raptor is turning out to be, has turned out to be. I like to start with Audubon because nobody has done more to tell the osprey story than um, uh, in his day than Audubon. Audubon really bought, brought this bird alive. Here you can see um, this painting. Take a look at any osprey painting before Audubon and then look at this and you can see that Aus Audubon really broke the mold. He was able to, to uh, bring a bird alive in ways that earlier painters, um, especially in Europe, were, uh, had, had no, no chance of doing. And uh, my hat's off to him for that and also for being the first really to write a life history of ospreys. He was the first person to think about how they lived and um, what it took to, to produce a, a brood of osprey young. And above all, he was also interested in how ospreys and people got along and how ospreys had captured the imagination of so many people uh, around the world and particularly in America. It was this famed bird, he said, already in Audubon's day the osprey was a bird that very many people knew. If we think about the things that set ospreys apart, what is it that makes ospreys so special? Well, first of all, it is um, the only hawk that lives exclusively on live fish. Other birds of prey uh, take fish occasionally. We think of a bird, for instance, like the bald eagle, which you have lots of in Florida. Um, but as you well know, uh, bald eagles eat lots else besides fish, live fish, and uh, they eat a lot of carrion. Um, they also chase ospreys and get them to drop their fish. They will even rob osprey nests and the nests of other birds that are open nesters where they're 
have an easy chance of getting to the to the young as they're as they're growing. Ben Franklin, when the United States was trying to determine what, trying to decide, the Continental Congress was trying to decide what the national bird should be, and of course most people there wanted the the bald eagle, but Ben Franklin was very, very set against this. He went down, he went down fighting and he, of course, he wanted the wild turkey, but his main gripe, as he said, was that the bald eagle was a, a bird of low moral character and uh, it should not be representing the United States, living on carrion, robbing ospreys and uh, just generally skulking around. No osprey would ever stoop for carrion or would ever uh, try and rob another bird, maybe another osprey, but not often. The other thing that sets um, ospreys apart and that we don't always focus on is um, how this bird is comfortable in both fresh and salt water. It, it nests equally happily and raises young just as well in both habitats, dramatically different. Here you see, here you get a look at the at the range of the ospreys in uh, uh, breeding, the breeding range of ospreys in North America, and you can see it extends all the way from Alaska across to, to Newfoundland and Nova Scotia down the East Coast. Quite a quite a robust population around the Great Lakes here. Scattered nests, no real nesting density up through the boreal forests of uh, Canada, but again, all of these birds are freshwater birds until you get to the coast. The larger concentrations, admittedly, tend to be uh, along the coast. Chesapeake Bay now holds the largest concentration of ospreys in the world. It has uh, over 10,000 nesting pairs now in Chesapeake Bay. That's about over 20% of the, of the world population. You in Florida lag behind a little bit, but not much. I think you've got roughly 5,000 pairs uh, in, in Florida and um, uh, here in New England where I live and on up into Maine, we have maybe three or 4,000 pairs. All of these of course have grown, grown dramatically in the last 50 years. We'll talk a little bit more uh, about that, but um, far fewer ospreys here half a century ago, um, but they are coming back um, very nicely. And here we, Find one of the other things um, that's special about ospreys, although other birds of prey also build large nests, ospreys build a particularly big one and they make, a, they make it an investment. This is a nest that, as I'm sure you know, is used year after year, often by the same pair. Um, and um, one of the things that um, ospreys don't fight about very much, but one of the things they do fight about is real estate. If they can, uh, if they put in the work to, uh, to set up a nest, over a couple of years and they come back perhaps a touch late from migration and find another osprey in that nest, they're gonna do their darndest to, to try and get that, that nest back. It's a, obviously the nest is, is critical for their breeding success. The earlier they can start breeding, um, the more likely they are to succeed. <clears throat> One of the real themes of this talk and I'll, I'll be uh, mentioning it in many, many different places is how extraordinarily adaptable ospreys have turned out to be as we have um, changed the world uh, in, in, many, in many different ways, some uh, less good than others. Um, ospreys have, despite ourselves, have turned out to be amazingly adaptable at taking to the structures that we build, especially for nesting. Here you see um, a high tension, a high tension line in Germany. This is in Mecklenburg, Germany. There are hundreds of ospreys nests, ospreys nesting on towers like this in Germany. It's helped to bring the bird back to that country. The Germans, uh, being Germans, have been uh, have done a splendid job of building little wire baskets that are bolted on top of these poles to keep the ospreys up away from the wires so that they can. Nest, success, nest successfully. If we have any doubts that ospreys are, are gonna make it into the 21st century, here is a nest on the ground at Kennedy Airport, New York City. These birds, uh, and they're not alone, there are other pairs doing the same thing. Um, these birds um, do remarkably well here. They are 
completely oblivious of the of the jets taking off around them. They're lucky enough to have really good foraging grounds over here um, to the to the right in the slide about a mile away is Jamaica Bay, which is um, a, a, a wonderful mix of salt marshes and estuaries where they can find lots of food. This is, uh, this is to show you how the other half live. These are osprey nests um, very close to my home here in southeastern Massachusetts. We've taken advantage of our extensive salt marshes. Um, we have um, many square kilometers of salt marshes in our coastal estuaries here. And um, the ospreys adapt beautifully to these marshes. Historically, they would have nested out on these marshes wherever they could find just a slight rise. It could be a washed up log or a little bit of um, a peat that was uh, knocked up by winter ice, anything to get them above the high tide. And uh, what we've done is just taken this one better and given them a slightly higher purchase above the, above the high water and uh, they adapt beautifully and nest year after year on low short platforms um, like this. We have a, a hundred pairs of ospreys within two kilometers of my house nesting on, on salt marsh platforms, um, very much like you see here. Some of them are a little taller, but um, they can get away with platforms even like this. This is the secret to ospreys in Chesapeake Bay and in many other parts of, um, of the Americas. This is, happens to be the Columbia River in Oregon, but uh, it could easily be Chesapeake Bay where at least half of those 10,000 pairs of ospreys are nesting uh, courtesy of the United States Coast Guard. Bless their hearts. They have let ospreys take over many, many, many of their structure, their, their uh, channel markers and <clears throat> their buoys and ospreys adapt just beautifully to these structures. As long as they don't obscure the lights and as long as the, uh, the buoys and markers can function for, for boating, the, the Coast Guard is, o is okay with it. And um, this is the ideal osprey nest site. This is what they dream of when they think of where can I nest? This is, uh, they love being over water. They like being out in the, in the open. Being over water, of course, gives them um, tremendous protection from from uh, mammalian and other ground predators. And this is as safe a site as an osprey can get. Um, I'd like to emphasize the community aspects of, of keeping ospreys going on many of these artificial nest sites. Here we see, um, a tip, again, a typical site on our, our salt marshes here. And there are groups of people all up and down the coast that are working on building these kinds of sites for ospreys, uh, family effort, uh, community effort, Audubon efforts. Uh, it's been terrific. It, and um, it, it's one of the things that warms my heart. And it's great, it's great to see a community coming together to support a local population um, the way we've done here and the way people are doing, as I said, <clears throat> all up and down the coast. Again, if there's any doubt that ospreys are making it into the 21st century, despite what the things we are building on this planet, uh, here, is, uh, here is proof. There is a company in Oregon called Osprey Solutions, LLC. Whoever would have guessed that this 50 years ago that there would be somebody putting his kids through college by, by putting out brush fires with osprey where ospreys are nesting. We call these problem nests where ospreys are nesting on areas where people basically want to get rid of them because they're obscuring lights at ballparks. They're shorting, they're shorting out wires on uh, high tension lines. Um, they're just getting in trouble and ospreys are going to be getting in more and more trouble as time goes on and we have more and more ospreys. Um, anyway, this guy, Jim Kaiser has uh, been uh, a brilliant and nimble in, in creating this company. And he's basically a consultant. You call him up, you send, tell, you, 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 send him, um, you send him your problem on the internet and he is able to craft a solution and uh, you, write him a, you write him a check and everybody's, everybody's happy. He can even come in and build these if you want, but most people end up doing the local building yourself, themselves. And essentially what you're doing is adding an extension, putting something, a platform, a, on top of the structure that the ospreys are trying to nest on so that you get them away from the, 
problem situations of being on the lights or on the, on the high tension wires. So jumping a little bit over to, to uh, my history and, and thinking a little bit about Florida, I'm not gonna dwell long on it because I think most of you know it pretty well, but I will mention Florida Bay because I find it a fascinating situation for ospreys. A hundred years ago, this was one of the major strongholds for ospreys in the, in the United States. Um, today, it is much, much less so. I hit Florida Bay, living in Flamingo for three winters. I hit Florida Bay in, gee, let's see, what was it? The late 70s, the early 80s. And by then, the population was already crashing. It was not doing well at all. I think we were down, I think historically, there were over 150, 200 nests in, on the islands. They're, they're nesting on mangrove islands out there in Florida Bay. And um, by the time I got there, we were down to, oh, maybe 30 or 40. Um, and I think there are even fewer now. And of course, the, the issue is something I'm sure you're all well aware of. It's just what you were talking about earlier with um, um, degradation of your fresh water, the fresh water sources that are coming into Florida Bay. Excess nutrients coming in there, um, creating algal blooms, um, killing fish, um, wiping out um, um, veg bottom vegetation and essentially just uh, cutting the productivity of what was one of the most productive estuarine ecosystems in the country. Meanwhile, any of you who drive the Keys know that ospreys are thriving all up and down the Keys. Um, uh, our family has a house in Key West, which I get down to from time to time. I'm surrounded by ospreys in Key West. They're nesting on every conceivable um, site that they can find, cell towers, ball fields, um, power lines. Um, and, um, and of course, this is true all up and down there. So ospreys that are able to get out away from the estuary, the polluted um, waters of the estuary and out into the ocean waters um, are, doing, are doing much, uh, much, much better. I would like to mention that um, the way we thank the Coast Guard for taking care of so many ospreys <clears throat> in Chesapeake Bay. I hope every time you pay your cell, your cell phone bill that you are thanking the cell tower builders in Florida. 20% of Florida's ospreys roughly are nesting on, on cell towers. I forget what these cell towers cost somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to $400,000. I mean, they're a major, a major investment. And ospreys happily move right in on, uh, um, I call this the high, the high rise in the high rent district and ospreys are moving in. And again, if they don't interfere with the communication equipment, the cell tower folks tend to leave them alone. Again, this is a super stimulus for ospreys. It's way high as I don't need, <clears throat> to remind you, and um, it has lots of nice structure up top where they can where they can fit their nest. Again, Blue Cypress Lake. I'm delighted that um, you folks are beginning to pay attention there, um, doing the monitoring. Um, and I'd only remind you to to um, remind yourself of how lucky you are to have a colony of this magnitude in your backyard. You have more ospreys nesting in Blue Cypress Lake, or you have as many, <clears throat> an equivalent population as in all of England and Scotland. You have two to three times as many ospreys nesting as in all of France or all of Spain. So, and we'll get to these areas in a while, I'll talk more about them, but I just wanted to remind you that um, the Americas um, for all of the troubles that we're having here, we have some of the most magnificent osprey and densest osprey nesting colonies in the world. A global species. We're gonna take a quick look at ospreys in a couple of other parts of the world, but um, there are four subspecies of ospreys, two that are migratory and two that don't migrate. Um, the North American subspecies, Carolinensis, that, as I mentioned, nests all the way from Alaska to Newfoundland, on down into Florida, along the Gulf Coast, and on into Baja, 
and winters primarily in the northern half of uh, South America, um, is matched in the Americas by the non-migratory Ridgeway eye ospreys, the white-headed ospreys. And you'll see a few of those along the coast in way south Florida, along the Keys. I occasionally see birds that are probably hybrids, um, Ridgeway eye. Ridgeway eye nests primarily on Cuba, in the, a little bit in the Bahamas, and over on the Yucatan Peninsula, Belize. There may be 100 pairs in Belize. Um, no real um, handle on the numbers in Cuba, but probably four to three to 400 pairs. Uh, we really don't know. Bahamas, another couple of hundred. So it's a tiny population of ospreys, but a very interesting one. And if you get to the Bahamas or Cuba, it's worth, worth taking a look. If we move over to the old world, we have the Haliatus, the nominant species of ospreys nesting all the way from Scotland to uh, Kamchatka and Japan, and um, on, on down through uh, parts of Mongolia, uh, wintering primarily um, in, uh, in Africa, especially West Africa, a little bit in the, in the uh, Indian subcontinent and in, South, in Southeast Asia. And then a non-migratory uh, population based mostly along the coast of Australia and in nearby islands like Borneo and New Guinea. So there we have it, um, four subspecies of ospreys. Some people want to carve them out and make them their own species. Uh, I don't really buy into that. I don't think that the either the genetics or certainly the, um, the, the structure of the plumage of ospreys is different enough to warrant that. If you see any of these ospreys, you're going to recognize them right away. The Ridgeway eye ospreys are very different because of their white heads. The Cristatus, uh, the Australian ospreys are quite different, a little bit different because their um, their plumage is, uh, they're a little bit darker in the head and um, have very dark breast bands and they're quite a little bit smaller. If we look at European ospreys, no country has done more to hold on to um, the uh, core of that population than Finland. When I'm giving talks to live audiences, I, I, I promise a case of, a, a case of, I bet a case of beer to anybody who can read or, and pronounce correct, tr read, translate and pronounce correctly any three words on this, on this, uh, on this sign. This is the middle of, the middle of Finland. Finland is one of those strange Serbo-Hungarian languages that uh, if you want to try and learn, you better, you better have a lot of time ahead of you. But like Canada, ospreys in, in Finland and actually in a lot of Europe are nesting, pri they're primarily a forest bird. And here you're seeing typical habitat in the heartland of Scandinavia. This is Finland, but it could equally be Norway or Sweden. 90% of the ospreys are in Europe are nesting in situations in these large remaining forests, these big spruce and fir forests <clears throat> in Northern Scandinavia. Quick look at the, at the map here. We see that um, Scotland has, uh, um, in the UK has most of the, uh, has a, a recovering population. We'll talk more about that. A few that are just starting to get down into England th thanks to transfers that are being brought down from from Scotland, uh, in the in the center of uh, forests, in the center of France, there's a, a slowly rebounding population. A few in in Spain. It doesn't show up well here, but in both southern and northern Spain, Germany, a rebounding population. But the vast majority are here in uh, in uh, western Norway, in Sweden, in Finland, and in uh, and uh, the Eastern European countries, uh, Estonia, uh, Latvia, and in, of course in Russia. The Finns have been, been successful in, in uh, jumpstarting their osprey population. They never really lost that many, but they've been able to stabilize and grow it by um, a huge artificial nest effort. And what they do is they cut the tops out of these pine trees or these spruce trees and build a platform. Not only do they build the platform, but they, <laughs> they build the entire nest and line it with material. So when the ospreys come back, they have absolutely no excuse not to get right down to it. And they do. They're roughly 1,500 pairs, 12 to 1,500 pairs in, in Finland. And they're doing 
um, extremely well. Every single nest in Finland is monitored throughout the entire breeding season. So they know the number of eggs, the number of young hatched, and the number of young fledged, and most of the young are banded. Here's the guy that's coordinating a lot of that, my good friend, my pal, my colleague, Perti Sorla. He's the Finnish banding legend. He's banned more ospreys <clears throat> than anybody in the world. And uh, at 77, he is still climbing nest trees to get to the nests of ospreys so that he can band yet one more. I think this is number 10,000 for, for, for Perti. He's quite a character, very much, very Finnish and um, a wonderful guy. Just a quick reminder that first of all, that osprey chicks are very cute when they hatch. You have to put one cute slide into any talk that you give. Here's your, here's your cute, here's the cute chick osprey slide. And notice that the egg is just starting to break open. You can see what we call the pip, the pipping hole. And the os this last hatch chick <clears throat> is about to emerge in the next 24 hours. Keep in mind, this is there's a hierarchy that's set up here. There's a runt. And when food gets scarce, it's that runt chick that doesn't make it. And these guys can get, the older guys can be really mean. They can be very aggressive. <clears throat> and you don't want to know what happens in an osprey nest when fish get scarce. <clears throat> it's, a, it's an ugly scene. But on to <clears throat> rosier picture. This is... The Finns and other parts of Europe have been, are so elated at getting um, ospreys back and their people are, are so excited about having ospreys in their midst that they have created these osprey centers. And this is a place where both tourists and scientists can come and see ospreys, get to study them. This happens to be an old trout, um, a trout hatchery. So there are trout ponds around. And the Finns are, have been brilliant at um, keeping these ponds full of trout. Needless to say, this is a huge magnet for ospreys. And they have built these, um, they have built these photography blinds, which people can rent by the hour or by the day. People come from all over the world. When I was there, there were people from Russia, there were people from Japan, and there were people from Oregon who were there. Um, bringing super expensive cameras so that they could get photographs like this. And they do this time and again. And the um, Osprey Center makes a lot of their money by renting their um, these blinds to photographers. So it's a win-win. Um, the center keeps going. Uh, the research on Ospreys in Finland keeps going and photographers go home with splendid shots like that. I think that the Pelican Island Audubon ought to think about establishing an Osprey Center where you can put, uh, you can essentially create sitting ducks and put a lot of fish in the ponds and people can get photographs like this. Think about that. I bet you have a place where you could do it. You need to artificially, um, uh, you have to boost the number of fish that are in the water. Ospreys will find them in no time at all. But on to the UK, equally interesting story. Ospreys were wiped out of England and Scotland by the early 20th century, by the early 1900s. And they were wiped out for a couple of reasons. Mostly they were seen as competition for fish that people wanted, especially trout. And particularly at the big landed estates um, where the wealthy um, went on weekends to fish and had gamekeepers, those gamekeepers became very effective and determined shooters and trappers of ospreys. Um, nests, again, as in Finland, are in places uh, like this, um, typically forest, forest nests, often deep in the forest, often hard to find. But again, the tip of a dead tree, getting them up above the, the forest canopy. Another factor in the decline of ospreys in the extirpation of ospreys in um, the UK um, was, uh, were egg thieves, egg collectors, they would have called themselves, but they were basically egg thieves and they stole eggs for two reasons. First of all, because the, being Brits, they are 
great collectors. They collect everything. And eggs, um, going back to Victorian times, were one of the great treasures for natural history collectors. <clears throat> and the other thing is that eggs were worth money. So even if you weren't a collector, suppose you were just some bloke working in a, in a, fact, in a factory in the Midlands of England, you would go, could go up for a weekend, steal a bunch of, uh, steal a bunch of osprey eggs, sell them to these rich, rich collectors and um, make more money than you'd make in a week in the factory. So those are some of the factors that were knocking ospreys back and essentially wiping them out. But by the 1950s and 60s, they were starting to recolonize. The Scandinavian ospreys migrate through Scotland and England on their way to Scandinavia. And eventually, a few of them lingered on. And they lingered on in places like this. I find land ownership in the UK fascinating. They, yes, they have their national parks. They have parks here and there. But a lot of the big holdings are in private hands, unlike in the Americas, where most of our big holdings of land are in government hands. Um, you know, you think of um, Department of Defense in the West, you think of Bureau of Land Management, National Parks, National Forests. I mean, I think something like 50% of the America's land west of the Mississippi is owned, uh, is government owned, but not so much in, in the UK. Instead, they're owned by these old landed gentry families that go back generations. Beautiful houses like this, splendid gardens, and, um, and they have oh, um, thousands of acres of forests, and it's those forests that ospreys first came back to and were able to find refuge in. Uh, as they slowly built up the population in Scotland. Scotland was where they came first. And gradually what's happened is they have been able to move ospreys down from Scotland into parts of England because the birds weren't colonizing there on their own. They did what's called hacking, where you take young ospreys before they can fly and bring them down to areas where you want them to be established. You feed them artificially. And then when they fledge, they imprint on that and fly around. They imprint on that area, the new area, and they come back to that uh, uh, after they migrate. I love this shot. The cast. This is this is the U this is UK ospreys in a nutshell. There you have, first of all, a beautifully built artificial platform with, I'm pretty sure, a webcam up on the top of that perch. A really nice perch for the birds to get away from the nest on. And in the back, you know. I think that's Windsor Castle, I'm not sure. Anyway, one of the great castles of England. Typical foraging sites for these UK castles. This is a lock, which is salt water, a finger of the sea that comes in to the land, a large estuary. Um, but they, most of the ospreys here are freshwater birds. They're living primarily, they're living a lot on trout. There's a lot of hatchery release trout now and ospreys do particularly well on that. Here again, another osprey center. This is one of the original centers <clears throat> going back to the 1960s when the first early 70s, when the first Ospreys came back to Scotland, the RSPB, which is their, their equivalent of our Audubon Society, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Don't you love it? And they uh, have been extremely successful. Over 2 million people have been to this one osprey center in Scotland. And there are, there's a, a store, you can buy osprey tea towels at the Loch Garden Osprey Center. They have a webcam, they have telescopes, they have blinds where you can take photographs. They don't mess around these guys. They do, they really go all out for ospreys. I mentioned the hacking projects that have brought ospreys down from Scotland to the Midlands to Southern England. Um, very successful project, in this case, financed by a local water company. These are wa freshwater reservoirs you see behind you here. here. Um, and they've built a, really a gorgeous nat nature center. If any of you get to <clears throat> England and have an interest in ospreys, and for that matter, lots else besides, this, this is a really wildlife rich area. Go see Rutland Water, it's near uh, Birmingham. Uh, a beautiful area and uh, very well set up and building blinds like this where you can watch the osprey nest. They have somebody 
monitoring these nests um, 20, uh, uh, 12 hours a day, uh, all the daylight hours. And they've done a lot of work on migration. Um, as many of you probably know, um, we've learned a lot about osprey migration because <clears throat> we've been able to attach, they're a big enough bird that we've been able to attach these little backpack satellite transmitters that essentially provide a GPS location, solar powered so the battery keeps going. And um, these are sewn on with cotton thread so the bird, they fall off after a year or two, the bird doesn't wear them forever. Um, and it turns out that they're really not much uh, uh, of an impact on the, on the birds uh, at all, a little bit, but not much. And the, we get tremendous information from this, <clears throat> from these uh, transmitters. Hundreds of birds have been tracked this way, <clears throat> excuse me, in England and hundreds here in the US. And this is the kind of detail that you can get that we never had before. Banding ospreys gave us a little bit of information about where ospreys were spending the winter, but nothing about how they got to, or very little about how they got to where, where they were going. This happens to be a pair of um, ospreys with transmitters, a mated pair of ospreys. So both male and female from the same nest were each given a transmitter. And here you see um, their typical migration down to West Africa. Note a couple of things here. First of all, um, one of them is male, one of them is female. So the blue and the red um, are spring and fall for male, blue and red or blue and orange, spring and fall for female. And you'll see they're essentially parallel tracks, but they are going to very different parts of Africa for the winter. They are getting, they are using land bridges as much as possible to get across the Mediterranean. Ospreys will cross water, but they don't like to do it any more than they have to. So if they can fly through Sicily to, to cut their water crossing to the Mediterranean in half, they'll do it. Sardinia and Corsica as well. Not only that, they're crossing the Sahara Desert, a huge barrier. And last but not least, they're wintering in totally different parts of Africa. They don't migrate together. Matter of fact, the female leaves um, at least two or three weeks earlier than the male does on, on her migration. And as my friend Rob Beregard, who's done a lot of the satellite tra tracking, likes to joke, ospreys are known to, yes, ospreys are known to stay mated for life, at least some of them do. And he said, maybe the secret to Osprey staying mated for life is that they take separate winter vacations. Sahara, four to five days across it, a huge barrier. Ospreys and of course, hundreds of other species of birds are migrating routinely across this desert, this major desert. Um, and how do they do it? they do it on fat. Ospreys will build up a fair layer of fat before they take off on their migrations. Some of the smaller birds like warblers and thrushes will um, almost double their weight uh, in fat before they take off on this kind of a journey and then burn that up or burn a good portion of that up in the four or five days they're using to cross that. So essentially they're fasting, they're not eating. They do get to rest at night, which uh, crossing water uh, ospreys are not able to do. Our ospreys, your, at least some of your ospreys, but all of our New England ospreys are crossing the Caribbean. They're flying down through Cuba. They're going through Florida, down through Cuba, over to Hispaniola, to Haiti and Dominican Republic, and jumping off about halfway down the, the Dominican, uh, the, uh, right at the border of Haiti and Dominican Republic, and flying for roughly 24 hours, day and night, nonstop. Ospreys can't land on the water. And they're flying fairly low like this. Here again, fat is powering these flights. And of course they have remarkable uh, abilities to find their way on, uh, on dark, <clears throat> dark nights, dark cloudy nights where there is essentially uh, nothing to guide them other than what they're bringing along themselves. Once they're in Africa, they settle in on, the, on beaches like this here. You see this wonderful painting by Julie Zikafus, who did a lot of the illustrations for my book. Um, one of the things they have to worry about uh, on wintering grounds, um, um, 
more so in Latin America than in Africa, but also in Africa are fish farms. Fish farms are great for osprey centers, but they are they can um, the, the flip side is that they can be <clears throat> a real magnet in places where people don't want ospreys taking their fish. This happens to be in Ecuador, but it could be in Poland. It could be in part of the Sahel in, uh, in Central Africa. And um, there are thousands of ospreys um, killed. Certainly we know thousands of ospreys killed in North America at fish ponds <clears throat> like this. They get shot, there's somebody living full time. And, um, and these are sort of mom and pop operations, these small fish farms here. Important source of protein for people in this part of the world, they need it. It's just too bad that ospreys and many other birds, herons as well, are getting nailed. There's somebody living in there and they've certainly got their uh, a shotgun. What's interesting is that the big fish farms, the more industrial, the more developed fish farms get away from these problems because they net, they have nets over, over, all, their, over all their ponds. But these mom and pop operations can't afford that. There are people that are now working with operations like this to bring um, uh, money and nets from the developed world so that we can begin to at least make some dent in the killing that's happening uh, at fish ponds like this uh, throughout the world. One of the other thing, neat things about osprey migration, for me, um, uh, things that I um, have grown to, to really appreciate is how uh, these birds, um, link us together. They're linking continents and cultures. Here you see a high school class in Senegal, West Africa, that um, has been um, linked up um, by, on the web um, by these uh, folks here who are, who are Scottish and are Osprey people in Scotland, being linked up with schools in Scotland. So the Senegalese um, students are learning about uh, where, Os where the Ospreys <clears throat> they see in their country and winter are coming from and vice versa. The Scottish students are finding out about where ospreys spend their winter and how they spend their winter in, in, in Senegal. And I, I'm really encouraging schools here in the US to think about making these same kinds of linkages. We don't seem to be doing it as well as the Europeans are, but um, I think there's real potential to, um, to, to have students learn not only about wildlife, but about different cultures. So there we have it. Ospreys on the wing, a new whole new generation. Um, and they've been doing this now for 40 or 50 years. Needless to say, ospreys were knocked back hard here in the, in the US and even in parts of Canada by pesticides in the 50s and 60s. Most of those populations have um, recovered completely and, mo and many, many have gone beyond their numbers, um, the numbers that they had even historically. And part of the secret for this, of course, is the ability of these birds to adapt to new nesting sites, the kind of nesting sites that we're providing, either building specifically for them or building anyway, and they are able to take advantage of them. The channel markers, the cell towers, um, even the open, even the open airports. So, in a nutshell, we have a survivor. We have a bird that, uh, unlike so many others, that we do have to continue to worry about. We don't have to worry about ospreys so much anymore, and that's, of course, a great relief and a great pleasure. Um, I hope you will continue to get as much pleasure out of the ospreys that are surrounding you as I get out of the ospreys that surround me here. Uh, in New England. I think Florida's, I think you're going to continue to see more and more of them. You may have to put in an occasional phone call to, uh, or a, an internet qu a query to Osprey Solutions LLC, but at least now you know how to, how, how to, <clears throat> how to put, get, how to put these birds back on the map in places where they may be, uh, may be having trouble. Thank you for having me, inviting me in this evening. It's been a great pleasure talking to all of you, knowing of your interest. And uh, any of you who are uh, inter interested in more information about ospreys, here's my new book. My email address is there. Send me an email and I will be able to send you a signed uh, and if you'd like inscribed copy uh, of, of the book. We can definitely arrange that.
appreciate your interest. Happy to take any questions. Excellent. So um, yes, I do actually have a couple of questions. Um, one, how do scientists know how many pairs of ospreys are in an area? Um, it, like in some of the states that you had, you had spoken of in the beginning of your talk. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, in places like the Chesapeake Bay, um, they are um, monitored very carefully, mostly by aerial surveys. So you, you take a small plane up and you fly, you're basically flying the, um, uh, you're flying the creeks, you're flying the, the areas where the ospreys are, are nesting, or at least that's part of the solution. There are also people who live in particular portions of Chesapeake Bay who have sort of adopted that area as their own, and they can do that by, um, um, they can um, cover those um, areas by boat. So there's um, enough hard data there that you can um, get a fair amount of, of the information that you need, and the rest um, can be often be done by extrapolation. Okay. Dr. Baker, I see you have your hand up. Well, I was just gonna say you, you uh, mentioned that Blue Cypress Lake, and thank you for doing that. Uh, Blue Cypress Lake used to be known as, as one of the great fishing lakes, but now it's known as one of the best places for photographers to come to take pictures of uh, ospreys. So I think the majority of people who rent boats there are getting photographers more than fishermen. So <laughs> Terrific. Any, any handle on what's happening to the fish populations in that lake? No, uh, we had uh, a, a year or two ago, we had a, a, a huge uh, outbreak of, uh, of uh, algae, blue green yep. algae, and uh, it uh, was, was horrible. They had dumped a bunch of um, poop, really, from uh, the uh, Miami area, from their uh, yep. areas, and on four areas but one of them was a, a ranch close to the Sebastian River uh, to the Blue Cypress Lake and they 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 stopped the rancher has really nicely stopped uh, doing that and the, the the lake is cleared up so that's terrific been... and we uh, another in nice thing about it is that there's uh, three areas that are in the north and uh, east of the lake are have been flooded and have been taken over as a uh, wetlands uh, area, huge area, about the size of the lake, in fact. And th they are producing a lot of fish too. So the, the uh, offsprings are going over there to get their fish. Terrific. Uh, and uh, so the population I'm sure is increasing. Okay, I have more questions. Um, is the height of the platform important? And how did you get interested in ospreys? <laughs> um, well, first questions first. The height of the platform is important, but it's also very localized. There's no standard height for an Osprey platform. It's gonna depend on where the platform is located. Obviously in those big forests in Finland, you have to get up high enough so that you're above the tree. Ospreys won't fly through trees or they won't fly through very far. So the higher up there you are, the better. Um, on the salt marshes, as you saw, where there are no trees and it's wide open, you don't need to go very high at all. You just basically need to go above high tide um, and high enough to keep them away from predators. <clears throat> so those are the two criteria um, and that varies, uh, that varies a lot. Um, I got interested in ospreys because a buddy of mine, Paul Spitzer, who did some of the early work on uh, population recovery here in New England and the pesticide issues, Paul was um, a wandering soul and he needed to, he felt the need to go away for a summer after he'd worked on ospreys for four or five summers. And he went up with Tom Cade to study peregrines in Alaska. I mean, I don't blame him, it's a tempting thing to do, but, um, and the project got left to me. He needed somebody to continue to monitor nests. And, that, and it was one of those things that just, happened at the right time in my life and I was ready for a new project. And this was a fascinating one to me. And I loved the environment that, um, I love the habitats that ospreys live in. I've settled in, I mean, essentially living in osprey habitat here in New England. I live within walking distance of salt marshes and, um, 
and tidal rivers and estuaries. So, um, so I think that's about it. Okay. Um, do all osprey in Florida migrate and others from the north come to Florida as we see them year round? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, okay. And we, we know that only because of these satellite transmitters. There was great work done by Mark Martell from, uh, from Minnesota that really, um, um, before that, nobody really knew where the Florida ospreys um, went if they actually migrated. They knew they left some areas. And the, the bottom line is that almost all uh, ospreys in Florida migrate, except the ones that are along the, the, the southern rim of Florida, the Keys, Florida Bay, Sanibel and Captiva, on down through the 10,000 islands. Those birds are living in a warm enough year round environment that they can find food all the time. But as I'm sure the bakers can tell you, and I may be wrong, I'm happy to stand corrected that places like Blue Cypress and Istok Poga, that uh, most of those ospreys are gone for at least three or four months a year. Am I correct in that? Yeah, yes, uh, I agree. Uh, but uh, it, they, they disappear more or less from the lake. Yes. And uh, the question is, do they go south or do they just uh, distribute uh, within Florida? I think they, we, most, we have... most of them, most of them go south. Most yeah. of them are going, to, believe it or not, a lot of those, um, not all of them, but a, a hefty percent, 60, 70 percent are going to South America. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And, uh, and what we need is a little bit more uh, tagging of our ospreys yep. here. Uh, yep on the Blue Cypress Lake to figure that out. But it's amazing, like your population up there in New York, how far they go, it's fantastic. Exactly, and I think that, let me answer the second half of that question because it's a very interesting and a good one. And that is um, essentially the person is asking, you know, why, why don't our ospreys just go to, I mean, all the people just go to Florida. Why don't the ospreys go to Florida in the winter? So. Um, and the, the answer is that there is, um, we don't really know, but um, it looks as if um, there are several reasons. First of all, there's a lot more competition. If all ospreys wintered in Florida, they would have a hard time finding the food they needed. And they would also be, um, uh, they would, there would be competition um, for the food uh, once, once, they get, once they get it, they'd be chased by other ospreys or by, bald eagles might also figure into the equation here. The second part of the answer is it's not that big a deal. It seems that way to us, but for an osprey to fly an extra five or six days and end up in essentially virgin habitat in the Amazon and give, and give them a, um, a, an environment and a climate that is just perfect for wintering, um, they just go and do it. So um, there are, hundreds of thousands of ospreys migrating through Florida, um, or at least 100,000 a year migrating through Florida and on down into South America. Okay. Um, this next one, I think you just kind of answered it um, a little bit before. Are all osprey nests open to the sky, not covered by tree limbs or other cover? And you said they don't like to fly through trees. So I would Yes, that's a yes. That's right. Again, I mean, the only places, and again, I, I, I defer to the bakers on this because it's such a unique situation, but the only place I've seen um, osprey nests that weren't completely open to the sky, and most of them are, that's what they want. But the only place I've seen where that doesn't quite fit are um, at these huge lake, cypress lake colonies where they're oftentimes nesting on cypress well, they are nesting on cypress boughs, and sometimes those are slight. Those boughs are slightly covered. In other words, it's not the sky that they're looking up to, looking up at. They're looking up at other branches, but they are also quite open, so they can fly into them easily. Do I have that right? Yeah, I agree 100% with that. They like the they they like to fly down onto that nest yep. <laughs> from the top and, and to lift off. Yep. 
Okay. And do the large wind farms in Scotland cause the ospreys much damage? Yeah, again, these are great questions. That's, that's a very good question. Um, not so much, I think, um, in, in, in Scotland. Um, I, I don't know of any records of ospreys. I could be wrong, but I, I don't know of any records of ospreys being killed by turbines uh, in Scotland. A couple of factors here, and I talk about this in the book. There are two things. Um, first of all, the turbines have changed a lot in the last 20 or 30 years, they're much bigger and much slower. So large birds are less vulnerable to the newer turbines. The old turbines killed a lot more birds and a lot more birds of prey. <clears throat> Second of all, ospreys are most vulnerable to turbines when they are built at constant migration concentration points. So there are places in Spain, for instance, where um, People worry a lot about not only ospreys, but other birds of prey, because there are huge wind farms that have been built in areas where um, there is some migratory concentrations. And again, I don't, and I should have that information. I don't have that information to know <clears throat> if any ospreys are being killed there. If they are, I can almost guarantee you that the numbers are small. Obviously, we don't want to lose any ospreys to a windmill, but um, if it's um, you know a couple of dozen compared to fish farms, windmills are insignificant. Wind turbines are insignificant compared on many orders of at least a couple of orders of magnitude more <clears throat> ospreys are killed at fish farms uh, compared to wind uh, wind turbines. Okay. Um, I have no other questions right now. I do have someone who said, thank you so much for sharing this fascinating info on one of my favorite birds. I, I had one more you. comment to make if, you, if I could. Uh, there were three uh, uh, eagles nests along the lake in, at Blue Cypress Lake. And I think the ospreys have actually kicked out the eagles out of their nest. And I, we were in Melbourne, which is a city north of us, and there was an eagle that had a had a fish in it, right, going over downtown Melbourne, and two offspray took off after it, and it got the eagle to drop the fish. <laughs> <laughs> there which, is some just, there is justice in this world. <laughs> I'm delighted to hear that. Yes, the secret the secret to ospreys dealing with bald eagles is that. Um, they need their safety in numbers. Right. And so if there, if you have more than um, more than a few ospreys around, they are much more likely to be able to deal with it. The ospreys that are most vulnerable, and we're seeing this along the coast of Maine. We're losing a lot of osprey chicks to bald eagles along the coast of Maine, and there it's the isolated nests <clears throat> that are that are vulnerable, and the 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 ospreys the the ospreys simply can't deal. One on one, the ospreys are, are, are um, uh, overpowered by the eagles. Good. Thank you so much uh, for a terrific talk. Uh, I learned so much myself on, on ospreys. And uh, we will put your book on our website to purchase. And I, I'm going to be one of your first customers. So thank you so much for, for, for your uh, presentation. It, and uh, you opened our eyes so much to what's going on it, w w to a bird that's pretty common around here in uh, Florida, so. Perfect, well, my pleasure, thanks for having me. Maybe I'll get down to Blue Cypress someday. Yeah, if you're, we'd love to have you, we'd take you out there and uh, show you the birds and the nests. Appreciate and, that. Yeah, good. Thank you all participants for being on board. And thank